So this is nursing care of the child with alterations in genetics. So remember, autosome means that the defect is on a single gene. It can be autosomal dominant. You only have to have one, not two, to have the disorder. Or it can be autosomal recessive, where if you have one, you're a carrier, but don't have the disease. You have to have two to actually have the disorder. Um, X-linked, again, they can be dominant or recessive. Uh, X is different because remember a female has two X's, a male only has one X. So a male, even if it's recessive, if they have it, it's going to act like it's dominant, where a female would have to have two in order to get it, to actually have the disorder. So here's autosomal dominant. Somebody has a disorder, whatever that might be, um, and or or a, a, it doesn't even have to be a disorder. Um, you know, brown eyes or unusual short or tall, and they pass it on to half of their children, half of their males, half of their females. They pass the normal gene on to the other half, and she doesn't have it, so she just passes a normal gene on to all of them. So every child has a 50% chance of getting it, whether they're male or female. Autosomal recessive means both parents have to be carriers. So the normal is the dominant one, and then the disorder is little. Um, so they both are carrying the disorder. They give half of their children the normal and half the disorder. So one lucky child gets the normal from both parents. Two out of four get a normal from one and the, the disorder from the other. And then one out of four gets the disorder from each. Now, every pregnancy has these same risks. You cannot tell a parent, being you had one child with a disorder, your next one won't have it. Your next one still has a 25% risk of having it, a 50% risk of being a carrier, 25% risk of not having it and not being a carrier. It's the same every pregnancy. X-linked, um, this uh, color blindness is an X-linked uh, um, disorder. So this mother has an affected X. She gives it to half her kids. Half of her daughters, half of her sons get the abnormal. The other half get the normal. Dad doesn't have it. So he gives normal X's to his girls, normal Y's to his boys. Um, so the boy only has one X. The X from the mother that was abnormal. So 50% of this mother's boys will be affected, 50% of her daughters will be carriers. So X-linked dominant means somebody has this. Uh, and in this picture, we have an uh, affected mother. So she's given the uh, affected gene to half of her children, half to her boys, half her girls, and she's given her normal X to half her boys, half her girls. Uh, the father, um, is does not have the disorder so we end up with remember you, this is dominant so you only need one you don't need two to have it so everyone the mother gave it to has so half of the children equally split boys and girls ethical and legal issues um, when we can test and know that you have a potential um, to pass on a disorder that brings up some privacy and confidentiality issues. Um, if you have a child then who does have a disorder, should, well, or can your insurance not accept them? Um, who should make decisions of, are you going to try for more children, even though you know you have a 25% chance of this disorder? So just some ethical things come up with this. But there are some advantages to knowing. Uh, first is that the parents get the correct information specific to them. Many disorders have varying degrees, and so they're getting the right information for them, tailored to them. We can confirm, diagnose, or rule out. Maybe um, something runs in the family. We can test and say, you don't have it. Your child doesn't have it. Or yes, you do. Or these are your risks. Um, we can 
identify and hopefully help families who need resources. And sometimes having a diagnosis does help get in um, some special resources. Um, prenatal testing can just help families to be prepared, knowing what they're going to be facing. And it also lets them make informed decisions about future pregnancies. Newborn screening. This is required in every state. The states do have slight different variations of what they test for. Uh, this should be done after 24 hours of life just because of maternal antibodies and things in the baby. Um, ideally, the best time is 24 to 48 hours of life, but it has to be before they're seven days old. If it comes back um, with something that was not conclusive, then they repeat it at two weeks of age. These are sent out and run by one lab in the country, so they take two to three weeks to get them back. They screen for things that are genetic disorders that you can't see or tell at birth, but they're disorders that are treatable, but most of them, once symptoms develop, the symptoms are usually irreversible brain damage. So as long as we know in advance and avoid whatever, uh, most of, many of these are metabolic, so if we avoid the foods that the child can't have, they're fine, but if we let them, if we don't catch it early enough, um, permanent brain damage has been done. So here's taking blood from that baby's heel and putting it on the card, and then it gets sent in. Down syndrome, um, trisomy 21, so it's three chromosomes in the three chromosome 21s instead of two. Uh, these kids have some degree of intellectual disability. They have a, a typical look to them but they have some other related health issues that we really need to assess for. They have a high incidence of cardiac defects, um, visual and hearing impairment, intestinal malformations. They have increased susceptibility to infections. They're at higher risk for thyroid disease and for anemia and leukemia. And just at the hospital last week, I was hearing they're also higher risk for um, diabetes mellitus. So here's how they typically look, right? We've got these small, low-set ears, small, upturned eyes, very flat, bridge of the nose, or really middle of the face. Um, small mouth with a large tongue, which is why they're mouth breathers, where most babies are nose breathers, right? But these kids tend to have that mouth open and the tongue out. They often have just a single simian crease across the hand, and they move their hand kind of, um, you can tell they bend it differently. They have a real wide gap between the first and second toe here and uh, different and minimal creases on the, the feet. So kids with Down syndrome, we want them seen by a cardiologist and an echocardiogram done early because there is a very high incidence of cardiac defects. They should be tested for vision and hearing routinely. We want them staying current on their immunizations um, and their kids we might consider doing those immunizations that we don't routinely do. We only do them at kids who are high risk. Well, these kids are high risk. And when they get sick, they tend, they can get very sick. Um, they should be getting thyroid tests six of months and 12 months and then every year after that. Monitoring them for respiratory infections, pneumon things, particularly pneumonia, and otitis media, ear infections, right? Um, early intervention and therapy and education that's tailored to them. Proper toothbrushing, have them into the dentist every six months. And then they're at risk for having um, instability. They, in general, have very loose joints, but they can have instability in the cervical, between the cerv cervical vertebrae. So they should have radiographs of the neck done somewhere between three and five years of age. And here's a picture. Fragile X. Um, this is very much like autism, except that it has a genetic cause, where with autism we don't know the cause. Um, so they tend to have cognitive impairments, especially on things that are abstract. Having them try and do abstract reasoning or math beyond simple, you know, concrete math, when you try and get them into that abstract math, they, they can't do it. They have problems with sensation, like sounds or textures, um, can be very emotional, emotionally labile, have behavior um, issues, poor attention, 
they do the self-stimulation of the hand flapping or rocking, biting, things like that. They tend to be hyperactive, can be, be very um, socially shy, want to isolate, stay away from others, low self-esteem, gaze aversion. So they'll glance at you and then look away. They don't make good eye contact. Um, so, and, and that there's nothing really we can do. Um, there are some medicines to try and help them with some of those problems, but you can't change that fragile X. So, um, some significant findings in the medical history when we see genetic disorders, maternal age, risks start going up when mom's over 35, risks start going up much faster when mom's over 40. We used to say paternal age didn't matter, and now we're saying, yeah, it does. Paternal age over 50, the risks start going up. Repeated preterm or breech deliveries. Um, often there's something wrong with these babies, which is why they either were born preterm, um, kind of a spontaneous abortion, or why they're positioned wrong. Things like congenital hip dysplasia can, can cause that. Uh, if we find abnormalities on the ultrasound or in prenatal blood um, screening tests, if there's abnormalities with the amniotic fluid, too much, too little, multiple births, um, babies that were exposed to a known teratogen, uh, you know, mom took some medication, particularly during those first three months of pregnancy, or babies that had decreased fetal movement. Those are all um, common um, findings uh, when we do that health history. Some inborn errors of metabolism. This is the infant who cannot metabolize a specific um, substance. And if it, they don't metabolize it, it builds up and usually does brain damage. As long as we don't give them that substance, they're fine. Um, so phenylketonuria and uh, maple syrup disease, the only ones I want to talk about. These have associated smells with them. The phenylketonuria, they can't it, digest phenyl ketones, um, but they get a mousy or musty smell. Maple syrup, urine disease is exactly what it sounds like. Their urine smells like maple syrup. Um, and those are things that as long as we don't let them have the, the substance, they won't develop any permanent problems. So how do we help families? Um, first, we've got to build a trusting relationship with them, right? That therapeutic relationship that they, we have to respect their feelings and not expect them to want what we want. They are individuals. They, we, they make their own choices and we support their choices. Um, so they may not do or want what you would want. Our goal is to support them. Help the family identify what their strengths are what their supports are, what their needs are, so and then help them come up with a plan to use their strengths and find ways to support um, their those things they they need more of. Um, this family may become exhausted. Help them to develop a plan for that. Do they have a place they can do um, some respite care, someone who can take care of this child? Because right, your average teenage babysitter is not capable. Um, so working with these families, assist them to communicate with among themselves. They have got to support each other. Usually when something happens, families either draw closer or they interact, they hand, respond to it differently and they pull apart. So our goal is to help them stay unified and communicate well. Um, referrals, give them referrals to support groups. No one knows what they're going through except somebody else who's gone through it. Allow them to talk, to express their feelings and their emotions. Encourage questions, but don't just focus on the child. Ask the parents how they're doing, um, because it's hard. Parenting is hard. Parenting a child with special needs is harder. It's good, but it's hard. So um, be sure we're asking them how they're doing.